Rain falls on a prune, and it swirls, and in swelling pushes up a lever. The lever presses down on an old flint lighter, which in turn lights a candle. The candle therefore boils water in a kettle, and the kettle, when it starts to steam, activates a whistle, which consequently scares a monkey, who as a result jumps on the swing, and the swing, like most swings, has great knives attached to it, yeah? and as the swing is rocking backwards and forward, it sides through a string which is anchoring the balloon, so the balloon rises in the air, the balloon is also tethered to cage doors, and so the cage doors open, and little birds, therefore, fly out, and the birds are attached to the umbrella, and hence the umbrella. Okay. There we are. Now you can see that there is a logical sequence of events, and I'm sure that we can't usually identify it, such would apply to gene activation. However, say the monkey wasn't scared. Say the birds thank you very much like being in their home cage then clearly the sequence of events is not completely 100% reliable. <coughs> Many things could change. Other things could scare the monkey, not the rain falling on the broom, and so on. So I don't want to labor this point too much, but I hope you can get the idea that you do not have one gene making one protein corresponding to one function any more than you have one brain area corresponding to one function. What you have is a subtle interplay. Any one gene can make 30, 40,000 different proteins. They, in turn, will act on all those different brain areas, on all those different circuits, doing many, many different things. And we only have a very vague idea, in most cases, of that connection. So let me give you an example of, even, even when that's not the case, even when we do have a very strong idea of the connection, very unusually, between a gene and a malfunction, even there, the thing is not as easy as you might think. Let me show you the example. This is a healthy brain. Well, it's not healthy anymore. The person has died, but then what's healthy? <laughs> and either side here, I want you to focus on this bit, yeah? These areas. These are naturally occurring, so-called ventricles, which are formed during embryogenesis, during development. Focus on the tissue either side of those, those, those holes. And compare that with this brain. And as you can see, the holes are much enlarged due to loss of the tissue on the adjacent um, sides of, of the holes. This is a brain from someone who had a disease called Huntington's chorea, which I'm sure everyone's heard of. Chorea after the Greek for dance, because the patient presents with wild, involuntary flinging of the limbs in a grotesque form of dancing. Now, the reason I'm suddenly talking to you about Huntington's chorea is this is one of the few, in fact, the only brain disease I know that does relate to one bad gene only, only one rogue gene. So this might seem to be a counterexample to what I've just been saying. Here we do know. One bad gene, one malfunction, absolutely no question. But even here, and even in mice, we can see that the situation can be subverted. It can be subverted by the environment. So here we have so-called transgenic mice. That's to say mice for whom the gene has been deliberately tweaked to give them the mouse equivalent of this movement disorder. Now, that's quite easy to evaluate in rodents because you can give them little tests and score their movements in various little tests. The higher the score in this case, I'm going to show you, the worse the movement. So why am I even telling you about this? Because if it's one bad gene, bad movement, you have these mice with the bad gene, they're going to have a bad movement, surely. Why am I even bothering to mention? The reason is that even here, even with little mice, even in the rare example of a single gene disorder, we can see nurture trumping nature, the environment making a huge difference. So let me show you this, to my mind, astonishing experiment that was published now eight years ago. Here you have um, the mice kept in the standard lab conditions, um, relatively normal sized cage. Compared to their counterparts, and this is done to scale, in a much bigger cage with ladders and wheels. This is a so-called enriched environment. Now enriched for a mouse doesn't mean to say they come here and look at fine art. It means that they have ladders and wheels and little food hoppers um, in a way that their counterparts do not. So in this experiment, the idea was to see could an enriched environment make a difference to mice who are genetically destined to have Huntington's career. Bear in mind, the higher the score, the worse the movement. So let's look and see what happened. Well, here you can see, as always in science, we have to do the control. The red group here are the animals that had not had their gene tweaked. So you don't have to look around. All you'll see is a flat line. Don't worry, it's nothing. Yeah? It's a flat line um, showing no score because the animals were, were moving perfectly well. However, their counterparts here in the standard housing were, as 
you would expect, as they were aging, their movements were getting worse, as shown by this increase in the score. Okay? That's exactly the gene, the bad gene, was sadly doing its job. The critical group, or the third group, those who were genetically identical to these guys, but had had enriched environment. What would happen to them? <coughs> would their movements be as bad as those in the standard housing? One bad gene, guaranteed you're going to get a bad movement. Well, let's just look. There they are. And you might imagine. So these guys, the score is much, much lower, about 20% that of the um, main group. And the age of onset is much later. So the age of onset is later, the degree of impairment is much more modest. So my case rests, I don't want to labor on about genes because we're going to get on to talk about creativity. <coughs> I hope I've convinced you that a gene is not an autonomous unit. A gene doesn't set the agenda um, unconditionally. A gene is necessary, but it is not sufficient for the final outcome. It is necessary, but not sufficient. It interacts all the time with events in the environment which will turn it on or off, other genes will turn on and off, and so on. So it's a much more interactive and complex scenario than, for example, the Daily Mail would have you believe. <laughs> so there is no one-to-one -one relationship, at least in the CNS, between a single gene and a complex mental trait. So that's the point I was making. And if you read the Daily Mail, you'll get, oh, I've seen some scientist about the gene for this or that. I love this, but I couldn't resist this. Um, this idea that you could dial up your life partner just by looking at their genes. And here we have some optimistic lady um, hoping for someone with humor, dependability, understanding, and conversations here. And we all know that no one has those four things together. Hands on, everyone has humor, dependability, understanding, and conversation skills. I don't know, I've yet to meet them. And, and so I don't, think, I don't think the trick is to go um, to get your life partner this way. There we are, I've shared before. Um, so, I mean, I'm joking, but similarly, this might apply also for planning your child. You know, some people fear in the future that. Um, before the embryo is implanted, you could have a genetic analysis or cherry picking in this way of, of having a child who's got those four traits as well. Now, that's, that's done, I know, as an absurd speculation, but the way some people talk about genes and mental function is almost uh, going along with that idea. So let's look instead at what really happens. And the fabulous thing about being born a human being is that, let's say, compared to a goldfish, is that when you're born as a human being, um, you're born with pretty much all the brain cells you'll have. But the exciting thing is this, that it is the growth of the connections between the brain cells that accounts for the growth of the brain after birth. So even if you are a clone, that is to say genetically identical to someone else, to your identical twin, you are going to have, this is really exciting, a unique configuration of brain cell connections. No one for the last 100,000 years has had a brain like yours. And after you leave this planet, no one ever again will have a brain like yours. They might have a liver like yours, lungs like yours, heart like yours, but they're not going to have a brain like yours. Your brain is a one-off. It's what makes you a unique person, even if you're a clone. And this is because these brain connections, and the exquisite thing about us, is they are going to be reflecting experience every moment you're alive. Now let's compare that with, let's say, the goldfish. Um, I don't know if you've got, your kids have got any goldfish as pets, but let's be brutal. If the goldfish died while your child was at school, you could sneak off to the pet shop, <laughs> purchase another goldfish, let's be brutal, and the kid would get no, no difference. Yeah? Now, you couldn't do that with a cat or dog, and they might want you to, but you couldn't do it with their brothers or sisters. Yeah? So as the brain becomes more sophisticated, you can't just um, replace one with another because you start to have individual repertoires of behavior, um, even for hamsters, they're getting used to being handled and so on. And so the more sophisticated the brain, the more you shift away from the imperatives of the genes, the dictates of the stereotype repertoire that characterizes, say, the goldfish, through to a much more personalized repertoire of behavior that is in turn the result of adaption. And human beings occupy more niches than any other species on the planet. Not because we run particularly fast, we're not particularly strong, we don't see particularly well. What we do fantastically is we adapt, and we adapt more brilliantly than any other species. Our brains, your brains, are built to change to every moment you are alive, to change those connections. This is what neuroscientists call plasticity, not meaning, of course, that the brain is made of plastic, but from the old Greek origin, plasticos, meaning adaptable or changeable. 